Hello, and welcome to SOE TV, that's School of Education TV. I'm your host, Dawn Krim, the Associate Dean for External Relations here in the School of Education here at UW-Madison. Today, I am joined by Lynn Fendler, and Lynn is our 2013 Distinguished Alumni Award winner. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you so much, Dawn. It's a great honor to be here. Well, I, I'm just honored to have the opportunity to sit down and talk with an award winner. So when you heard that you won the award, how'd you feel? I was speechless. Okay. <laughs> I thought, how can this be possible? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So now fast forward to your current position, faculty position at Michigan State. Yeah. How would you say your experience as a student here informed your professorship now at Michigan State? Yeah. Teacher education is very complicated. Okay. I'm in a department of teacher education. That's the main thing we do, although I teach primarily curriculum, which is the, the study that I did here. And there's as most people know, a great deal of pressure on teacher education to become um, an instrumental and bureaucratic kind of activity. Okay. What I learned in my doctoral work is the value of intellectual work for preparing teachers and thinking about teaching. Okay. So having said that, think about teachers today that are in the classroom that are trying to take what they've learned in their programs and actually put them to practical use. What have you learned that you think those teachers could gain from what you can share with them based on your philosophy and your teaching and what you're doing now? Maybe I should give you some examples from a course I'm currently teaching. That'd be great. I, t I teach in the master's program at Michigan State University, a Master of Arts in Teaching and Curriculum. And this semester I'm teaching a class called Curriculum in its Social Context. Okay. And I designed the class to have several uh, units. And one of the units is on the history of standardized testing. Ah. Okay. So an intellectual study uh, uh, historically of things, phenomena like testing, comes from my work here mm -hmm. as a doctoral student. And I bring that into my teaching. All of my students are working teachers. They're okay. all practicing teachers okay. going for their master's degree. Okay. And they appreciate so much learning about how tests were developed okay. and why tests were developed. And the fact that tests were developed, standardized tests were developed early on as mechanisms to uh, equalize education. They were invented as social justice moves because oh. there were many teachers and schools who were not serving some students okay. for unjust and discriminatory reasons. Okay. And so tests were introduced to try to hold teachers accountable huh. for not leaving some children out of an education, making sure that all children got an education. That was a long time ago. Since that time, yeah. the purpose and reporting of standardized tests has changed so much that it almost has exactly the opposite effect that its original intention was. So when I teach that to my working teachers, yeah. they get, um, vocabulary and arguments and understandings that they can bring to their own practice and they can also use with the parents in their classrooms to help them understand how tests work and how test results are being used now okay. for you know, purposes they weren't originally intended for. So taking that a step further, I'm a parent of two middle school children, sixth grade and eighth grade, and as you can imagine there's a round of testing that yes. happens and my kids say why do we have to do it and I always hear people talk about teachers teaching to the test as a parent help me understand what the testing means for my kids in today's times testing can mean very different things in different kinds of schools okay 
Mm, you might have heard things like school report cards oh, yeah. and underperforming schools. Oh, yes. Yeah. And testing in high performing, usually well resourced schools has a different effect in the classroom. Okay. From teaching in lower resourced schools. Hmm. who are under a great deal of pressure to raise test scores. Right. Okay. In high-performing and high-resourced schools, the test scores are generally high. Yep. And so teaching to the test does not necessarily, does not all the time, completely dominate school and classroom time. Okay. But in lower-performing, lower-resourced schools, it can. And teaching becomes a matter of coaching people, coaching the children about how to do well on the test, whether or not they can uh, understand what's going on and without any regard to things like developing intellectual curiosity right. and, and inquiry. And okay. Wow. Well, that was really fascinating. I didn't mean to take you all the way down that test rabbit hole, but so, it's on people's minds. Yeah. So also, I understand the type of work you do, you're also looking at morality issues within education. So moving away from testing, how does morality come into play? I can actually connect it very closely. Okay. Um, I call my work ethics of knowledge. Okay. Okay, so within curriculum, curriculum we study knowledge. We study how knowledge is invented, how knowledge is different from place to place, what knowledge is valued at what times, how knowledge is different from school and the university, okay. um, uh, what science, science contributes to knowledge, what history contributes to knowledge, what arts contribute to knowledge. We study all those things. Okay. Um, uh, my particular area is the ethics of knowledge. So I am concerned about the ways in which Things we take for granted as knowledge may have harmful effects on children. And mm. since we're on the topic of testing, yep. I will give you the example of a recent project I did on the history of the bell curve. Okay. So most people yep. know about the bell curve. Yep. Um, Gaussian curve, which is originally represents a distribution of um, binomial probability. So it's what it's supposed to represent is the more times you flip a coin, mm -hmm. the more times you flip a coin, the higher the probability that you'll have an equal number of heads and tails. That's all the bell curve does. Okay. But then there was this amazing thing that happened in Belgium in the 1840s, spearheaded or formalized by a Belgian statistician by the name of Adolphe Quetelet, who was very religious. Okay. And he had the idea that a God-created universe must be symmetrical. It was a religious idea. Okay. And he set about creating statistical tests to make empirical things in the universe appear as though they were symmetrically distributed in the ah. world. The bell curve is not a product of inference of empirical testing. Huh. It's not. And this is a major problem for the ethics of knowledge right now. Since it was imposed as a religious belief, okay. then it got imported into the social sciences. Okay. And even at the time though, so August Comte, who was the founder of social sciences says we should never use the bell curve in the social science world. Mm -hmm. um, John Stuart Mill, we should never use a bell curve in the social science world. But all of those critiques are mostly forgotten. Mm -hmm. And they've been import and the bell curve has now been imported right. as if we can sort people right. using this distribution. And so we create tests that sort people yep. into a bell curve, which is entirely criminal in my mind. Wow. So in knowing that, that, I mean, that's fascinating. In knowing that, how as a intellectual of studying that type of information, how do you then move forward uh, the notion that it's not accurate and we shouldn't be using it? Do you develop a new theory? Do you um, 
write papers and go to conferences yes. and talk about the anti-bell curve. How do you yeah. then um, expose it as a misnomer? Yes, um, I do the research, publish okay. it, present it at conferences. On the basis of my previous research, I was recently invited to contribute to an encyclopedia on the bell curve, okay. which is going to get a wider readership. Okay. I use it in all of my classes. Um, I, it's not difficult for people to understand mm -hmm. when we tell the history that way. Right. And the history, no history of statistics disputes that. Every history of statistics tells exactly the same, there's no dispute okay. about the history of the bell curve. It's just wow. for, the history is forgotten. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I, and I, so, I can probably say many people have probably not um, looked at the bell curve in that way. That's so exactly thank right. you for educating us. That's the about center of the my bell work. Curve. Thank wow. You. Thank you. So I'm going to now take you a little bit out of the sure. academic depth okay. of your world and just talk to you about how it's how you feel to be back in Madison to come back and accept your award and yeah. and just what what good feelings come to mind from being here. I love Madison. I I think I mentioned to you earlier. I lived in Madison for 25 years. Yeah. My children were born here. They went to Marquette Elementary School, O'Keefe Middle School, graduated from East High School. Wow. I lived here for all that time, um, both in school and, and working around. So I have very fond memories. And I was also able to go up to the ESL program in Helen C. Whitehall okay. and meet five people that I used to work with there, which was just delightful. Uh, uh, to see them, they're still doing the same program, wow. and um, it was wonderful. To see. I walked up and down State Street. It was wonderful. To see, I'm going to go to Wednesday Group again oh. this afternoon, and uh, present a paper there. So, the uh, seminar that was so much a part of my graduate school experience, I will be able to go back and work the work with the doctoral wow. students this afternoon. It's all really a thrill. Well, and this yeah. is fascinating because this this is exactly what we hope to capture when we have an opportunity to celebrate the good works of, of our alumni and to have them come back and spend some time with campus and spend some yeah. time with graduate students. So in going back to that seminar, what advice might you share with those students about where you are now? The biggest thing I would say is hold on to what you're really passionate about. Okay. There will be a lot of pressure for doing the kind of work that um, maybe looks like it's more hireable or will get grant funding. Okay. And what's really important is that people who have good hearts about teaching will always remember that in their passionate way while they go through graduate studies. Then in order to hold on to that is to keep connected okay. um, with the faculty and with all the other doctoral students who will then help uh, make your work accessible to other people. So to frame it in ways that you will be able to do the kinds of job searches that you want okay. without sacrificing what you really care about as an intellectual. Okay. So lastly, when we think about teacher education and we think about kind of the period that we're finding ourselves in where teachers don't feel as, preci as appreciated yes. as they once yes. were, um, what can you say about, about the profession and about the appreciation for teachers? Teachers are getting together now. Teachers are starting to some great movements uh, uh, and taking care of each other and taking things into their own hands. They feel very committed and passionate about their children and they can tell when some new reform is not good for children. So I've seen okay. tremendous work of, of teachers getting together. Um, there are also a lot of teachers and parents who are opting out of testing mm -hmm. in ways yep. that um, requires a great deal of communication and solidarity okay. to do what they know is right for the children. Yeah. Well, I hear all that social justice coming out that you <laughs> talked about learning when you were here in the program. It has certainly stuck with you. And again, congratulations to you on receiving the 2013 uh, Distinguished Alumni Award. We are so pleased and proud 
So thank you for coming back. Thank you, Dawn. It's really my honor. I appreciate oh, it. You're very welcome. So I want to thank you, the viewers, for spending time with us today. Lynn Fedler sh certainly shared a lot about her history here and all the good works that she's doing out in the community. And teachers, hang in there because there are good days coming ahead. And thank you to our video producers for being with us today on SOE TV and that School of Education TV. Take care.